What makes the curriculum fit for purpose and how I would define the curriculum is that it has to be well organised. So the practical business of taking the national curriculum statements and translating them into learning experiences for children and learning outcomes. We need to be able to, as teachers, to be able to see our route through that. It needs to be well resourced. It needs to be well matched to the needs of students. And of course, it has to be well taught. But as Tim says, you know, the national curriculum, it says what we have to teach, but it doesn't say how, it doesn't say why, it doesn't say for how long. There, are, there is guidance, approximate guidance on how that, you know, maths should be about between 10 and 12 and a half percent. But pretty much we can decide how we're going to do that. And it is for us as professionals and it is for us as schools to decide that, that distribution. Now, my school is um, got 2,000 pupils and uh, aged 11 to 18, and we're on a dual camp. We have two campuses for the comprehensive part of the school. And uh, I'm not going to play the education version of the a Monty Python Three Yorkshiremen, where I try and trump people by telling you about how deprived it is and uh, how many barriers to learning we, we encounter every day. I'll simply say it serves an economically and socially diverse community. So those are the harsh realities of leading a school and providing a curriculum that's fit for purpose. At key stage three, we have an accelerated route. So all of the, the, the programmes of study for key stage three, they're all completed by the end of year eight. We have a, what we call our general route, which is the... Uh, the programme of study for Key Stage 3 is delivered at what we might describe as the normal pace. And we have a transition route, which is a primary style curriculum where for some students who aren't ready to go through the milestone of September, where they go from uh, being in one classroom with one teacher to going to 14 classrooms with 14 teachers and lugging all their stuff around with them and not knowing who they're going to sit next to. Um, that then that, that's not right for everyone. And we like to think that we're able to use that flexibility to create a curriculum which is fit for purpose. And the motto of my school is non nobis solum. And uh, that means not for ourselves alone. And I, was, and I thought when I went to the school, the children should learn something about the history of the school. They should, if, if the only bit of Latin they ever learn is the bit that they're wearing on their blazers every day, they should learn to do that. And so we make sure that through our structure, there is the opportunity for enrichment days where they can learn about the history of the school, they can learn about, uh, they, we can do information advice and guidance, we can do more expansive PSHE, we can do a broad range of things and do what we call our London curriculum because for many of the children in my school, they're only eight miles from central London, but they might, it might as well be the planet Zog, because they don't go there. And we use that, that, that flexibility to do our intervention and to create um, and to use cross-curricular projects to develop our curriculum. But the commonality is the approach to standards, approach to presentation in terms of le lesson programming. And... Um, one of the challenges, of course, uh, for those of you who lead multi-campus schools, is about how, how you deploy all of your teachers. Now, we have a 25, uh, 25 lessons, each of one hour duration, and a one-week timetable. And so we have to find a way of fitting everything that we want to do into that model. We can't do, we've decided we're not going to have a two-week curriculum because the idea of having teachers who have to go all around the, 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 the uh, Edmonton uh, and not knowing where they are is probably too much to expect from, from the teachers at my school. When we go on to Key Stage 4, which starts in, uh, in, in Year 9, we've got a pretty much traditional core curriculum of maths, English, science, but the thing that we do is we make sure that they, their, their curriculum IT, they do all in year nine. And so that gives us then the flexibility when they're in year 10, that they, we can use that to do additional bits of science, additional bits of maths, and additional bits of, uh, uh, of, of English. And 
that there are curriculum structures which enable us to do that. That sounds as if it's quite traditional, and it sounds as if it's quite, uh, and it is, I think, one of the things that Tim was, was saying was about the way in which the curriculum is defined by the qualifications. I'd like to think that it doesn't define what we do, but it, is, it has to dominate our thinking because the children at my school, you know, we've told them that their education really matters and they know that the only way in which they're going to create the lives that they want for themselves and to create better lives and better chances for their children is through education. And they know that they have to have those qualifications. And so I think there's always a tension in secondary education in particular when we try to, uh, to, when we try to introduce things which are probably at the, uh, at one, at, at, at the other end to the qualifications framework. No, we, try and we do a general education programme as part of our sixth form offer. And, of course, we get the, the students saying, why do we have to do this? We're not being taken and examine it. And it is a particular challenge. There are, there are some things for us to, to, to think about. Um, much of the curriculum is defined by what's in the qualification structure, and that focus is on the academic. But what we're trying to do is to create that vocational curriculum and indeed an alternative curriculum for the students, particularly at Key Stage 4, which does blend knowledge and skills. Many of you will know the work of Mike Tomlinson, who still talks about the 14 to 19 curriculum. And I think that has pretty much dominated the way in which we've constructed our curriculum. And you may have come across the recent report, which has been published under uh, Barry, Barry Shearman, and that was co-chaired, co -chaired, uh, there was an inquiry co-chaired by Mike Tomlinson and Ian Ferguson. And I hope that the recommendations of that report will be taken up, because it is about um, how the curriculum can be matched to the needs and the aspirations and the desires of of children and young people and providing them with both the knowledge and a skills-based curriculum. And I hope it will be taken up, because, and, but I would urge you to read it because as heads and school leaders, we can think about how we can take the recommendations about curriculum design, looking at it holistically and use the freedoms to develop alternative new approaches. What matters is the outcomes for children. And at various points at Key Stage 3 and Key Stage 4 at my school, we adjust the curriculum to take account of their needs. And we think that gives us a curriculum that's fit for purpose. <laughs>